Hello, and welcome to Avenard's next episode of Imagine What You Will Do With AI. We're very privileged today to have Nia from Microsoft. Nia, thank you so much for taking the time. It's fantastic to have you on the show. Can you tell us a little bit more about your role at Microsoft? Sure, really excited to be here and uh, looking forward to this conversation, Catherine. Um, at Microsoft, I'm part of an EMEA AI team called Global Black Belt. Um, we're a group of experts in AI. As you can imagine, we spend probably 95% of our time with no, I can imagine. <laughs> generative AI now. Um, uh, we work with organizations to help them solve business problems with generative AI. Yeah, fantastic. So I would say let's dive in. So first question, I really enjoyed your keynote at Big Data World last week. Awesome. Um, Paul, my co-presenter, and I actually were talking in a previous episode about the strategic trajectory of AI going forward over the next couple of months, which you also uh, touched upon in your keynote. So um, agentic AI, um, the integration of SLMs now into use cases, um, as well as LLMs, of course, um, satellite connectivity, which obviously at Avenard we're also um, engaging in right now. And you mentioned a few topics in your keynote that I would actually love to touch upon now. So uh, scaling laws continuing, um, multi-agent AI systems, multimodal and multi-model approaches to use cases, and that every developer will be an AI developer going forward, as well as the shift from use cases to actually reshaping business processes. So can you elaborate there? Um, because we're all really on tenterhooks. Excellent. So um, it's been a really, really interesting time for anyone who's been involved in the AI field, and I think even for people who, who weren't. And what we've seen happening is the emergence of models that can do things that just were not seen before. Models that can reason, okay, I know some people are upset when we say that because AI doesn't really reason, but it looks like it is reasoning and solving problems. In order to achieve that, the companies that are developing these large language models, they need huge amounts of data. I so can imagine. What, what we've seen, if you look at the field of AI before, we've seen uh, training compute, so the, the compute that we actually use to training these AI models, we've seen it grow in a rate of about one and a half, one one point four percent, sorry, one point four times every year. Um, since the emergence of uh, deep learning, which is kind of the foundation of all of these AI technologies that we're seeing today with generative AI, that was about 2010. We've seen the amount of training compute available for training these uh, models, the notable ones. Uh, grow at a rate of more than four times a year. And we are seeing that continue. Microsoft as an organization also increased its um, availability of GPUs, you know, these supercomputers that are used to not only train the model, but also inference so for people that actually want to use them. Uh, we've seen that infrastructure grow 30 times in oh, wow. a year. Wow. I was uh, having a chat with a childhood friend about, uh, he's a radiologist. So, you know, radiologists need to look at thousands of images uh, when they're doing an MRI scan and what they're looking is for abnormalities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that requ requires someone, you know, a fo focus for a long time to not miss anything um, in all of these scans and then combine all of that information together to some kind of an opinion, right? So researchers in that field wanted to figure out, okay, now we have these models. At that time, it was GPT-4V. So for those who don't know, GPT-4V was the previous version okay. of GPT-4O, mm -hmm. right? So it, it kind of, it could accept images and inputs, um, but it wasn't as sophisticated as GPT-4O. The test was done with GPT-4V. And what they've done is they've given uh, GPT-4V the um, exam, it's a standard exam that radiologists go through um, before, you know, they qualified to be a radiologist. Uh, so it's quite a comprehensive exam. GPT-4V answered 65% of the answers correctly. Wow, just um, astounding, wow. I am dying to see what will happen with GPT-4 because we know that the image, cap image processing capabilities, because it was trained on so much more data, mm -mm. it will have more, more of that knowledge, even in that specific field. Um, and we expect the, the percentages to, to rise. I mean, testing that we've done, it has an amazing ability to understand almost anything that uh, that is presented to it, like really and deep as you analysis. As very multimodal 
as well. Yeah, exactly. So you know, when you when you use these kind of technologies, mm-hmm. you can do you can do amazing stuff. You can um, take an, as an example a document, and yes, understand the text, but also understand all the images that are embedded into the document. So when you you know when you apply to engineering or healthcare or pharma or um, even even law you can actually do so much more with this capability, uh, multimodal capability, notwithstanding the ability to speak and the ability to listen to speech and uh, understand that rather than just text. Um, but just just talk us through, um, because you also said that, that, that use cases would get progressively more multimodal and um, a lot of our clients are in the mid-market. So potentially now being able to leverage and... Uh, SLM as opposed to an LLM, so a, a small language model um, for something like summarization, as opposed to having to take GPT-4, you know, could keep their their costs uh, you know, a, lo- a, a lot lower. Um, Correct, yeah. You know, could, could actually be quite a game changer, I would say, for their bottom line, um, as well as for topics like security, obviously. Um, so yeah, talk us through the, the multi-model um, point that, that you also made. Really, it's a really, really interesting point, Catherine. Um, and I bet you your uh, clients are kind of complaining about the cost, especially especially the I mid market one. They are quite <laughs> exorbitant, so potentially, yeah, yeah, the integration of SLMs now too is, um, yeah, exactly. You know, because <laughs> the, the thing is, with these models, they're large language models, as the name suggests. They use a lot of compute mm. in order to give you the responses that you're looking for, right? That compute costs money, so someone is paying for that money. And if you're developing in a generative AI application that is only using these large language models. When you look at the ROI, what kind of business problem am I actually solving? And what is the business benefit that I'm getting by developing this application to automate business processes or uh, take out some uh, cost from maybe call centers or whatever I'm trying to do? I need to always measure the cost that I'm going to be paying an ongoing cost to, to run this application versus the business benefit. Yeah, I mean, it's basic cost benefit analysis. Yeah, e- exactly. Yeah. And some of the tasks can be done by a much cheaper, smaller model because they're not, uh, they don't require the same level of reasoning and uh, understanding that so maybe the big summarization, models. presumably. Exactly. Yeah. That is a really good example. Or uh, classifying. So, you okay, know, if you, yes, if you yeah, have, yeah. give you an example, if you have an email and you want to know, uh, broad terms, what is this email about? That's a classification task. A small language model can do that. So if you start thinking about it like that, and you break all the tasks that the generative AI models need to do mm. as part of the application, and you say, okay, the simplest ones, I'm going to pass to a SLM, which is going to be a fraction of the price, and only the ones that require reasoning and decision-making, I'm going to pass to the big LLMs that are costly, then I can actually control the cost and do something that, it, uh, that is, uh, you know, makes sense for us. So the SLMs actually really solve a problem for us. I think also um, for devices with limited processing power as well, like mobile phones, for instance, SLMs will also be quite a, a game changer. Spot on, yes. You know, now I was talking to um, uh, someone about F1 tech that they have on the track. Ah, yeah. yeah. So because of mm. the speed mm. uh, of what is required, they, they cannot have, they don't have the luxury of, you know, waiting for the latency of uploading stuff to the cloud and waiting. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> because we're talking about like sub-second yeah. responses that they need. And they were talking about um, introducing SLMs, mm. which are like, you know, they're very responsive, they're very quick. Introduce SLMs to do some of the clever things like reasoning over, over data that comes from the, these vehicles on track. God, that's and I brilliant. Thought, that, is, that is amazing yeah, if really you can introduce generative edge, AI there. Yeah. Because wow. o- otherwise it's prohibitive, you can't do it. Yeah, yeah, wow. Another question, I guess, also that we get a lot from our clients is actually how to create a competitive advantage out of this technology. Um, I think a lot of last year was spent just trying to make the horse faster, so not actually re-envisioning our processes, reshaping our business to accommodate this technology, but actually create value in a totally different way. Um, yeah, I guess my question for you is, how do you actually fuel a competitive advantage with transformative technology like generative AI? And 
what does that mean for, I guess, the operating model for, for business processes? Obviously, in your, your keynote last week, you talked about actually reshaping business processes, re-envisioning the business. So yeah. can you just talk me through that? So what's interesting, actually, is um, if we take ourselves maybe even six months back, um, the technology was not ready for some of it, mm, right? Yeah. So I'll give you an example. Um, a lot of organizations were really taken aback by like, what this model can do. So when you interact with it and how natural conversation is when, when you interact with this technology, it really answers things like a human has an uncanny ability to understand intent, what you really want to understand or, or to know. And the answer is even if there's hallucination, which we'll put aside for one second because we have ways of dealing with that, but even if it hallucinates, it gives you um, an impression that it, it really answers what, what you're looking for, uh, what, what you want to know. So people said, ah, can we take that in consumer conversations, right? And, and I'm saying that in the context of a, a competitive advantage, because if you think about what organizations, consumer-facing organizations, this is just one example, what they've been doing up until now is they've been using traditional bots. What those bots do is they... They have a bit of AI trying to understand intent. It has to be trained with all the types of intent that you want to serve with a spot, right? So let's say, uh, just give an example for a bot that need, um, is, is responsible for refunds or returns. Uh, you need to, it needs to understand when someone wants to return something. And then it will take you through a structured journey. Okay, that's what you need to do. Step one, ask you questions mm -hmm. along the way, but it's not natural, right? It's, it's predefined, it's it's all, all of it is predefined. Everyone said, we have generative AI now, which can actually have a, a conversation and collect data along, along the way. It doesn't need to be instructed in the detail. It just needs guidance. You just need to tell it, this is what we want you to do, and the bot will figure, figure out how to do it best way. But it wasn't fast enough, right? So every time that you asked a question or gave it some information, it took up to 10 seconds. So when, you, when, you do, when you're conversing with the technology, it doesn't seem natural, right? Along comes GPT-40 and makes it much easier to do that because it's fast. It's a much, much, much faster model. In fact, it's, um, I think, six times faster than the original GPT-4 oh, wow. model. Yeah. So now we can do stuff and, sorry, it can also accept images, allows us to do... It's the multimodality. Multimodality, and it can also um, accept speech. So you can talk to it rather than just typing stuff. So it allows us to do stuff that we, we, couldn't, we couldn't do before. Now, think about yourself, maybe try and put yourself about six months into the future or one year into the future. As a consumer, you would probably be super disappointed if bots are still as clunky as they used to be. You would expect them to be like yeah, a generative we're, AI. We're getting very demanding because of the hyper personalization. So yeah. I always, <laughs> I always think it's kind of customer 360 on steroids now. E exactly correct. And what I'm saying though is, we are not seeing wave of organizations actually um, opening these um, conversational AI bots in every single consumer con um, touch point that they have with consumers. We are seeing, we are seeing the, the first shoots of that. So we have them around and a lot of organizations are using them, but they're using, using them for very, very specific tasks. What I think is going to happen soon, organizations that want to really gain the competitive advantage in that space, and that's, again, I'm focusing on consumer, but just because everyone knows what, um, what their own experience is, and it's easy to talk about. But I think organizations that really want to have competitive edge are going to introduce these technologies in almost every touch point with uh, consumers. So th think about shopping assistant. You know, when you're looking at an e-commerce website, it's dumb. It doesn't understand what you want. And, and you can't, you can certainly not describe things in natural la language. Like I'm looking for uh, a gift idea for um, anniversary or whatever it is, right? They cannot deal with that. But shopping assistant can. So I'm expecting these things to become more prevalent in the industry with consumer conversations, both on the shopping side and the support side, because again, support is a super annoying thing okay. um, for consumers and costly for, for organizations. We're seeing that 
already starting to happen. But I think the organizations that are going to take it on board and shape most of the business processes to do with consumers, both on the sales side and the, the support side, the after sales side, will we'll definitely gain a competitive advantage over, over the competitors. Organizations that don't face consumers, like um, think of pharma or think uh, of healthcare organizations, uh, FSR organizations, these organizations have great deal of inefficiency with internal processes in different areas. It's either people finding information or business processes that re require a lot of manual operations. Just masses of digital debt. Massive digital debt. And, and the, the interesting thing is, there is a conception at the moment that I'm hearing from a lot of places that you, you have to sort out your data states uh, in order to use the CI. What we observe is that while organizations are working on uh, redefining the data states to allow these AI systems, there are a lot of cases where the AI is clever enough to deal with the imperfections of your data systems and make sense of data, even if it's not perfect. It is a kind of circle of life, really, isn't it? Because you can use the generative AI to then actually help tackle some of your data problems. Just, just Spot mind blowing, on. really. That is exactly it. And going back to competitive advantage, if you wait, and these data projects or IT projects, you know, big, big transformational IT projects can take years. Oh, they can. Yes. <laughs> you know. Um, so if you wait until you finish that and only then start with your AI journey, you will find that a lot of organizations have already done that and you're now scrambling to try and keep, keep the, uh, or competing with them. Yeah. And they have the competitive advantage. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Nir. And just, just on your point, I guess, about um, retail and consumers, I think one of the best examples I've seen about how an organization has just done something totally different um, with transformative technology was a retailer where you walked past the shop window and they filmed you and then they projected the clothes that were on the mannequin on in the shop window onto you, which that I just amazing. thought was just a fantastic, very short customer journey. It is amazing. And you know, the interesting thing is we, we probably could do them um, even two years ago, but it was a huge, great, big, massive project to do that uh, with big teams of data scientists. And again, you, like you think about the um, investment versus the benefit. Oh, yes. And now with generative AI and the capability of the models, you know, to process image images and generate images, um, it is a much, much, much easier thing to do. I think also um, I've noticed quite a, a shift in, in the, I guess, terminology moving from a minimum viable product to a minimum lovable product. Like a lot of people talk about minimum, minimum lovable products now because you can actually get something. I mean, yes, you should you know, expose your, your product really early to end user feedback. So it should be an MVP. But now you've actually got the, the possibility to almost have an MLP at the same time, which is just I can you know, totally relate to so, that. So exciting. So uh, I'm feeling really, really energized um, after that fantastic discussion. Thank you so much for your insights. Um, it's been a pleasure, Nia. Thanks Excellent. For your time. I love this conversation. Yeah. It was really, really <laughs> nice. And, um, you know, nice, nice to be here and, and uh, uh, cover all of these topics with you. And actually, I learned a few things today myself. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> I'm delighted about that. So uh, to our listeners, um, goodbye. Thanks for listening. And um, we will see you next time on Imagine What You Will Do With AI.